Good day, this is Steve Anderson and uh, welcome to our pre-webinar. We're about three minutes from start time and uh, we're looking forward to a great webinar today. So as you're signing on, welcome. Uh, just as um, a, a course of review, if you've never been with us before, <clears throat> you're on listen-only mode, which means that uh, you should be able to hear me uh, and um, but we will not be able to hear you. So you're welcome at any time to submit any questions that you might have in the question bar uh, that's on your, uh, in your control panel on your computer. Uh, you can just submit a question. We'll deal with those uh, at the end of the formal presentation. So uh, we're looking forward to some great, we, we're just back from the annual event a week and a half ago, it was awesome. Uh, before we get started, <clears throat> just a couple of housekeeping items and announcements. Uh, very much looking forward to the Smiles for Life kickoff March 1st. Uh, we'll promises to be our best Smiles for Life campaign yet. By now, if you've signed up for the Smiles for Life campaign, you should have received your marketing box with all of the marketing materials that have been very generously assembled by my social practice. And by now, <clears throat> you should have made your first order of whitening kits from Ultradent. And again, we're very grateful to Ultradent for their generosity in making all of the things we do in Smiles for Life possible. So uh, if by chance you have not uh, received your marketing box or you have any questions about Smiles for Life, feel free to call the Crown Council office at 1-800-CROWN-58, and uh, our team there can help you. Uh, coming up, just by way of uh, news, <clears throat> so uh, one week from this Thursday, uh, 50 Crown Council me uh, members will depart for the Dominican Republic for another one of our humanitarian dental expeditions. A uh, week after that, 37 more will depart for Guatemala. And uh, the Crown Council and Smiles for Life humanitarian expeditions uh, continue to grow and impact. Uh, there are uh, a few spots left for the November expedition to the Dominican Republic. So <clears throat> again, you're welcome to call the Crown Council office if you have an interest in that. And then finally, uh, you can put on your calendar March 19th, Tuesday, March, March 19th will be our next webinar. Uh, on financial arrangements and collections, making sure that you uh, collect everything that you produce. And we're gonna have some specific uh, skills and training, uh, thanks to the team at our Total Patient Service Institute uh, that came out of our insurance coding webinar last month. Uh, so you wanna make sure and, and join us for that. So with that, uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, what I've done here, some of you that are on the line today um, may have attended the annual event, others may not have, and what I've done is selected some of my favorite action items that regardless of whether you came or not, you can implement in your practice. I'm going to introduce you to, uh, for those that weren't able to join us, some new Crown Council mentors that shared with us. And uh, so we hope you'll, I hope you've got uh, something with which to take notes. Uh, I'm gonna give you a rapid fire list of things that you can do that will uh, improve the practice. Uh, for the annual event, here's our mission uh, when, when we do each year when we do the annual event. It's, it's first and foremost about the person, meaning everybody that is in the practice and making each individual a better person. And then what can we do to better serve the patient that overall then helps the patient and builds a better practice? And so you'll see that flavor as we go through these action items is uh, there will be some personal things that every member of the team can do as well as uh, things that you can do to better serve your patient and things that uh, will make you a better team. And that is uh, what makes the annual event unique uh, among all dental meetings, it is very personal and team focused and how to build uh, a greater culture of success in your practice. So idea number one comes from our first mentor, James Lawrence, who's also known as the Iron Cowboy. 
uh, having completed 50 triathlons in 50 different states in 50 days. Uh, it was just an, an amazing human feat. And he had some not only great uh, inspiration, but also some things that would help every practice. So first is to examine your belief system about yourself and what you are capable of. This is a guy who accomplished something that all of the medical experts said was, would be impossible. And so he had to redo his own belief system of what was possible and challenged everybody at the annual event to do the same, is to re-examine your limiting beliefs, what's possible and what you can really do. What are your beliefs in terms of the career you've chosen and den dentistry in general? There is more changing today in dentistry <clears throat> than perhaps maybe any other time in history. And anytime there's change, there is tremendous opportunity. And so what's your outlook on that? Is, is the outlook, wow, there's change and so it makes it more challenging or is it, this is an amazing career? Just as a, a footnote on that, US News and World Report came out with their annual list of the best jobs in America. And dentistry, once again, took uh, three or four of the top 10. I think there was a tie in there somewhere. Uh, so den dentistry continues to be ranked as, uh, as one of the best careers, one of the best jobs that you can have. So what's your belief about that? And what are you doing about it? And then finally, what's your belief about the practice? what is possible for your practice and uh, the team that you have. And so that was his challenge is what are your actual beliefs around all of those things and to write them down and, and re-examine them because your beliefs may be the biggest thing that's limiting forward progress. Uh, next is gratitude for everything. Here is a specific action item uh, that came out of uh, James's mentorship is for years we've talked about in your morning opportunity meeting starting with the best thing that's happened uh, so that you can focus on what's working and leverage on those things and one uh, suggestion that he made that we have applied is that occasionally you mix that up and do one thing for which you are grateful for from yesterday. So if there was uh, something to have everybody on the team or a few people on the team select uh, something for which they're grateful and that's a, uh, it might be gratitude for another member of the team, it might be gratitude for a patient or a supplier that helped out during the day. Uh, but uh, we all know that uh, gratitude is part of a culture of success is a key ingredient. <clears throat> so that would be a suggestion is mix up your morning opportunity meeting from time to time. And uh, instead of doing the best thing that happened yesterday, do one thing that you're grateful for from your day, your previous day of, uh, of patient care. Uh, number three is what is your one decision? And uh, this was a uh, a challenge that James gave us is, you know, the one thing, if you had uh, one decision that was your most difficult or something that would make you tremendously uncomfortable to have to either decide or do or something you've been putting off, uh, what is that one decision? For him, it was doing an amazing uh, feat of 50 triathlons in 50 days in 50 states. And uh, he encouraged everybody to determine what's your one decision uh, along those lines that if you were to make it would be transformational that might change the trajectory of what you're doing personally or professionally uh, or in any other area of your life. But what is your one decision uh, that you would make to make yourself uncomfortable uh, intentionally? Uh, number four <clears throat> is uh, for years we've talked about self-talk and the challenge uh, that he issued was to re-script your self-talk, especially in those areas where you might face the biggest challenge. So, for example, what do you say when things do not go as planned? This is a, perhaps a team activity 
to to have a team meeting and a discussion about what do we say to ourselves, what do we say to each other when things do not go as planned. For example, uh, what do you say when a patient no-shows? What do you say to yourself? What do you say to each other? And because the, the self-talk then determines the action, which ultimately determines the outcome. So these are just a couple of examples. What do you say when the patient no-shows? What do you say when the schedule falls apart? What do you say when a procedure takes too long? Uh, what do you say when a patient gets impatient? Uh, these are all the things that, that what do you say uh, to yourself and what do you say to your fellow team members? Uh, so he had some great examples of uh, an amazing team that surrounded him in, in his great feat. And the things that they said to him and that they said to each other that helped them move through <clears throat> some of the most challenging parts of their accomplishment. And so the, the challenge, the task was don't leave your self-talk up to chance in the moment, script it out beforehand so that when something happens, when that triggering event happens, when things don't go as planned, which they always do, then the self-talk is, is scripted in advance and everybody has rehearsed what are we going to do when things don't go as planned so we get the outcome that we want. So another great team exercise, write that down and script out and have some agreements. What do you say? What do you say to each other? What do you say to yourself when things do not go as planned? Uh, next is this is this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, one of our Crown Council co-founders, Walter Haley, who always said that you can't get out of something you've never been in. And uh, before you think of, of exiting or, or changing something, ask yourself, have I really been all in uh, in what I'm doing? So where are you holding back? Uh, what would all in look like if you gave it uh, everything you had? And and what would you be doing if you were a rookie again? If you were just hired in your position and you were trying to prove yourself, what would you be doing differently than what you're doing now? What can you do to be all in uh, in every aspect of what you're doing? And so that was, again, another challenge and, again, another great personal as well as a team exercise is where are you holding back what would all look what would all in look like and what would you be doing if you were a rookie all over again uh, number six is a question of who's on your team again i mentioned he had an amazing team that surrounded him to be able to accomplish what he did and his challenge was to to recreate or create your personal team uh, who is it that cheers for you, that keeps you going, that's on your home team? Uh, sometimes there's a need to weed some of those folks out and put some people on the team that are your biggest cheerleaders that help you be successful. And so that was his, his challenge and his suggestion to us is who, who's on your team, who's cheering for you, who keeps you going, and how do they do that, and have you chosen them with care. And then finally, uh, a, a personal question is what will each what will each person do to be a better team member? And that's a reflective question. Uh, what can, because we can all do things uh, to be a better team member. So what can you do to be a better team member today and every day? Uh, one of my favorite quotes is what kind of a team would our team be if everyone on it were just like me. Let me say that again. What kind of team would our team be if everyone on it were just like me? So what kind of team member can you be in and how can you improve your team member performance? The team is just an accumulation of everyone on it. And that was his challenge is what can you do to be a better team member? What else can you do beyond what you're doing now? Next, let me introduce you today to uh, Rob Schallenberger. Uh, and uh, Rob talked about uh, building a better you uh, with some leadership principles 
I'm going to share of 12 that he talks about. We're going to talk about three today uh, that you can do to be a better personal leader, uh, not only in the practice, but also in your personal life. So first is a reminder, a question about what's your personal vision? Uh, a lot of times we talk about the practice vision and the business vision. What are you going to do to, you know, what do you want the future to look like and writing that out? And Rob's challenge was that every member of the team should have a personal vision of not only for your life, but also for uh, what your position is in the practice. If you're going to to really make that position shine <clears throat> and do everything you can, then what is your personal vision for your position in the practice? So there's a, a reference here on the screen to the goose. And this is one of my favorite Aesop's fables about the goose and the golden egg. Everybody's familiar with it, but there's a very powerful message in it as it has to do with your personal vision. Uh, so as the, the fable goes, it was the, the poor farmer and his wife, They one of their last possessions was a, a prize goose that they had. And the farmer went out one morning and, and the goose had laid a beautiful golden colored egg. And he wasn't quite sure about it, so he took it into town to the assayer and he examined it and sure enough, it was solid gold. And uh, he asked him where he got it and he told him. and. And so the next morning he went out and lo and behold, there was another golden egg and so forth day after day. And so within a very short period of time, uh, the farmer and his wife became phenomenally wealthy. And so they're sitting at breakfast one morning and they said, you know, we could probably just speed this process up a lot and not have to wait for the daily gold ration. Let's just kill the goose and get all the eggs at the same time. And so he goes out and wrings the neck of the goose and slices them open. And lo and behold, there's nothing there. And so the moral of the, of the fable is don't kill the goose. The goose is the producer. And a lot of times we mistake the patient as being the golden goose, when in reality it is the team. It's each individual member of the team is the goose. And so Rob's challenge to everyone is take care of the goose. You need to have your own personal vision for you and your life, as well as your own personal vision for your position in the practice. What are you there to accomplish? How can you perform at the highest level? What do you want that performance to look like? And have that vision written down. And then of course, a vision for your team. So this would be a challenge for your team and a great team meeting is to have every member of the team write out their vision for their position on the team. What does their position look like that they were hired for? What does it look like when they are performing at their very, very best? And have everybody write that out and share it. The more clear everyone is on what top performance looks like, the faster top performance is going to show up. Uh, next, roles and goals. So again, once you've defined the vision, then what are the goals in each of those areas? So what are your personal goals? What are your goals for your particular position in the office? We always talk about office goals and his challenge was to have specific goals in writing for your position in the practice. Uh, and then as we've always talked about that you review them on a daily basis, they're up where you can see them <clears throat> so that um, uh, you, they're fresh, you can renew them and you make them work. So the shift here and the challenge would be not only to have practice goals, but to have everybody on the team uh, that they set some individual goals for their position in the practice, have those written down and hang them up in the office so that everybody on the team can support them <clears throat> in their uh, efforts to make their position even better uh, on their team. So again, there's another great team exercise. Uh, after you get your vision written, then everybody gets to write out goals for their particular position uh, in the office and what they're gonna do to make that, that role even better. 
Uh, next action item is around what uh, Rob calls pre-planning. So pre-planning is taking and setting aside the time to, for example, he talked about pre-plan your week. So sitting down a week in advance and planning the most important things that are going to happen <clears throat> in your week around the goals that you've set. Now here's another application. First, your personal pre-week planning uh, to schedule the time to do that so that you are more productive as a person. And then the second application is as a team. Uh, so the question is, are you having a weekly team meeting? Uh, so to differentiate, everybody has a morning meeting, a morning opportunity meeting, we hope. The weekly team meeting, which can last for about 60 minutes without food. So this is not a meeting you do around food, but you do it just to meet 60 minutes. And its purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, is to work on the practice and plan for the next week ahead. So you'll look at the schedule. You're going to plan, <clears throat> plan your days look at where you're winning, look at where you need to improve, uh, and you're going to and you're going to work on the practice for at least 60 minutes a week. There's a great resource on the Crown Council website at crowncouncil.org uh, under the training tab. Uh, if you go to webinars, and, and actually the easiest way to access this is just go to the search bar in the upper right hand corner of the Crown Council website. The name of the webinar is To Meet or Not To Meet, and it goes through all the different types of team meetings that we recommend that you have <clears throat> if you want to create a culture of success in the practice, as well as their recommended agendas for each one of those. And, and so one of those agendas is for the weekly team meeting. So if there's an opportunity for an upgrade there, uh, that's a great resource you have available to you to, to improve in that area. Uh, the next pre-planning idea is for your morning opportunity meeting. And as a reminder that your chart prep is a form of pre-planning. So the best morning opportunity meetings uh, happen when everybody on the team has done their chart prep. So the front office team has prepped all of the information about new patients and uh, emergencies, if we know about those at the beginning of the day. Uh, the dental assistants <clears throat> and the doctors have prepped all the restorative patients, so we know exactly what's going to happen with each one of them. And the hygienists have done all the chart prep around the existing hygiene patients that are coming in for the day. So that during the meeting, we can have a strategic discussion about what the objective is for each patient, where the opportunities are, where the opportunities are for same-day treatment. Uh, but the better job everyone does of pre-planning and doing their chart prep, the more effective the day will be. So just another application of pre-planning on a team basis to make your days much more effective. The best teams that we work with, the best teams in the Crown Council and, and the practices that we work with at Total Patient Service, the best teams we work with consistently produce more than scheduled on a daily basis. And the way they're able to do that consistently is by having a very effective morning opportunity meeting. So they plan it out, everyone does their chart prep, and they have a discussion about how they can leverage the schedule and deliver the very best service for the day and help more patients get more of what they want. So pre-planning and chart prep. Uh, next, one of the big parts of the annual event is we talk about your doing good strategy. Obviously, Smiles for Life being the, the largest charity campaign in dentistry is a big part of our doing good strategy. And there's a number of things that we highlighted this year as a reminder of things that you can add to your doing good strategy. So this is just a reminder. Uh, this is phraseology, words matter. Uh, the Crown Council, we do not believe in giving back. Uh, we believe in doing good. Giving back implies some level of guilt uh, around that you maybe you took something that didn't belong to you. And uh, so we prefer to, to discuss our efforts 
in those areas is doing good. And uh, we are on the, the doorstep of the Smiles for Life campaign for uh, 2019, uh, having raised over $42 million uh, to date for children's charities. So it's a great part of your doing good strategy. I made some announcements about that <clears throat> um, earlier on in the program. Uh, if you've signed up for Smiles for Life, you should have received your marketing box by now from my social practice, and you should have placed your first order for whitening materials with Ultradent. And again, we're very grateful to Ultradent for their huge contribution uh, to the Smiles for Life campaign. Campaign starts on March 1st, and uh, goes through the end of June. So we are looking forward to a banner year this year uh, for Smiles for Life. Uh, any questions around that, you can call the Crown Council office at 800-CROWN-58, uh, and uh, our team will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Just a great part of your doing good strategy. Um, we also talked about the uh, now uh, well into past its 10th year of our Smiles for Life humanitarian projects that we have going on in the Dominican Republic, in Guatemala, in Nepal, uh, and now we have uh, uh, members doing things in Africa. So just a huge part of your, your doing good strategy as well. And that actually can, uh, can be combined with some of your Smiles for Life efforts. So if that's, you know, if a humanitarian trip is something that you and your team would like to do in the future, give us a call again at the Crown Council office and we can help you plan how to do that. Those typically are planned a year in advance, uh, although we do have uh, some late breaking opportunities here in November this year. Uh, so, um, you know, give, give that some thought. It's a great thing to add to your doing good strategy uh, to be able to benefit a, a whole culture with your dental expertise. Uh, we, we spent some time talking about our Miles for Life ride. Uh, this is an annual ride that we have done. Wow, for now I, I believe we're going on 13, 14 years. Uh, this year, this summer will be what we're calling the final curve. It'll be our, our last Miles for Life ride with uh, Roy and Glenda Hammond. Uh, it raises money for Smiles for Life. Uh, and <clears throat> if, you, um, if you have an interest in going with us, uh, you can find the information at milesforliferide.com. Uh, it's gonna be a great experience. There's a little snapshot from last year's ride through, uh, uh, through Yellowstone National Park. That's my wingman, Dr. Ed White. And um, we have a great, great time. We're going through the Grand Canyon this year, but again, it raises money for a great cause. And then finally, most of you are aware of Eagle University, which is a nonprofit education foundation benefiting high school and college students. Another way that you can do good. Uh, we have practices all over the country that sponsor students to go to Eagle U. Uh, and you can find more, more information about that at eagleuniversity.org. So those are just some examples of doing good. And uh, one of the things we talked about at the annual event is, is developing your whole doing good strategy uh, so you know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and uh, it fits into your whole practice philosophy. Uh, for those of you that weren't at the annual event, let me introduce you to Ingrid Lee. Uh, Ingrid has become... Uh, somewhat of a sensation around the world. She's written an amazing book called Joyful, uh, The Surprising Power of Ordinary Things to Create Extraordinary Happiness, which has huge applications to dentistry. So let me give you a, a, just a couple of thoughts along these lines. This is one of my favorite quotes uh, from Winston Churchill, who said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us, meaning we create our physical environment and then our physical environment has an emotional impact on everyone who enters. And, and Ingrid talked a lot about this is what we choose to put on our environment then has an impact on everyone who works there and has an impact on patients. And so she talked about just kind of simple design things as well as things that you can do to create a more joyful environment for your, your patients. And so here is the question, is how can you make 
for starters? How can you make your team meeting space uh, more joyful, a fun place to be where you're energized and excited and, and looking forward to be being in that space? So that's a small uh, little task of what things that you can put in that space. I can give you a Dozens of different examples from Crown Council offices around the country of what they've done just to make their team meeting space fun and uh, motivating and invigorating just with the coloring they choose, the posters, the signs, uh, the things that they put in that space to make it a, a joyful and an exciting space. Uh, next question that she posed is, what's one thing you can do to make the patient experience more joyful? And her challenge to us was to map out the entire patient journey through the practice and with intent plan certain things during that journey that make each encounter a, in her words, joyful encounter. What things can you do in terms of things that you do with them, things you give with them, give them, uh, what can you do to map out that entire patient journey. We talk about this a lot. It comes up almost every year at the annual event, and it's a great reminder to go back and, and remap the patient experience and what are we doing at each point of, of engagement to make it a, a joyful experience. Next, uh, this one I found a fascinating piece of data, uh, and one of her uh, things where she encouraged us to bring nature in the practice. And, um, and here's, this is the piece, I, this was something I learned this year, was that the science says that plants, anything green that's growing, has a tendency to evoke feelings of generosity. Uh, so one of my first thoughts was, well, if that's the case, we ought to have plants all over the financial arrangements area in the practice. So interesting scientific data that uh, plants tend to evoke a feeling of generosity. Uh, and so uh, that is in terms of creating the right emotional environment is interesting food for thought of how you can apply that. And then finally, what's your most under leveraged spot, meaning what is a place in the office that kind of gets ignored, that's maybe visible to patients, but you've just kind of ignored it. What can you do to transform it to create and make it a, a, a joyful spot with maybe better coloring, a plant, uh, maybe a sign, but something that'll, that'll make some of those forgotten spots uh, add some life and a better experience uh, for the patient and for the practice. So a huge body of work here, obviously, but it was a great reminder of how the environment we create can evoke different emotional, emotional responses and we can control that. Uh, finally, you know, she talked about how you express joy at work and what kind of culture you've created around that. Is there room for laughter? Is there room for kind surprises? Uh, is there room for appropriate play <clears throat> at work? Uh, because that impacts your not only your culture, your culture of success, but also the patient experience. So that might be a great team meeting application or question to say, how do we? How do we express joy at work? And what kind of a an environment do we have around that that makes it a, a happy and a joyful place to be? Uh, she, she challenged us to create a learning culture. And because a culture that's learning uh, is growing and emotionally is much more uh, stable and exciting to be around. Uh, we highlighted uh, one of the practices that's part of the Crown Council in um, in Bridgewater, Virginia, that has done some great work. Um, the McIntyres have done some great work to create a learning library in their practice uh, where team members are, are encouraged to learn and to they have uh, tests they can take around different books and programs that they can check out of the practice. And that was Ingrid's uh, challenge to us is to create a learning environment at work. 
Uh, the annual event is big on awards and recognition. And if you've never been, I just thought I'd just highlight, we do a lot mm -hmm. of recognition around Smiles for Life accomplishments. Uh, we do some, uh, some great recognition around the practices that were, that raised a lot of money. And uh, this is a, a picture of our great friends from Ultradent uh, and uh, some of the great recognition that we did for the teams that also uh, made big contributions for uh, mm -hmm. Smiles for Life. This is one of the fun things we did. We had some Cirque du Soleil performers that helped us with our Smiles for Life recognition uh, at the annual event. And we recognized all the teams that, <clears throat> were, that really made a, an amazing effort this year to raise a lot of money for, uh, for Smiles for Life. So it was a fun, huge fun uh, celebration that we had with, uh, with all the teams that did so much to make it happen for Smiles for Life. We also uh, recognized our qualified members, and uh, every year we have new uh, Crown Council qualified members uh, that uh, we recognize for their efforts in, <clears throat> in uh, accomplishing that. If that is something that your team has yet to do, I would encourage you to, to go to crowncouncil.org and go to the downloads section and download the qualified member requirements. Uh, so that whole section has all of the information on the eight things that you need to do to be a qualified member. And in our book, these are eight things that every practice should be doing. In fact, you're probably doing most of them. And uh, so all you have to do is submit uh, certification that you are doing those things. Uh, but there are eight very simple things uh, like having regular team meetings and getting patient feedback and working closely with your lab to improve the quality of your clinical work, uh, things like that. So uh, I, I challenge you to, to download the qualified member requirements, work on those, and be recognized as a Crown Council qualified member practice uh, it's just one more designation of, of having a, a great culture of success in your practice. Uh, we also do a lot of team and individual achievement awards at the annual event. Uh, the team of the year, as well as the young dentist of the year. Um, we always have some, some great teams and, and stay tuned for that <clears throat> because we will have uh, information coming out later this year where you have the opportunity to submit nominations as well as vote for the different awards that we give each year. Uh, we talked a lot about mastermind groups uh, and uh, the value of that whole process of meeting with a group of like-minded peers on a regular basis to help each other build your practice. We are creating new Crown Council mastermind groups uh, on a daily basis. If you are not a currently a member of a mastermind group, I'd encourage you to email spencer at crowncouncil.com uh, and uh, let him know about your interest. We have Crown Council <clears throat> mastermind groups for doctors. We have mastermind groups for office managers and administrators. And we are now creating our first mastermind group for hygienists. So uh, anybody is, uh, is welcome, and we're creating new groups all the time. Uh, it's one of the qualified member requirements, and it can be one of the most, most powerful things that you can do uh, that will help your practice grow. So again, you just email spencer at crowncouncil.com and just put mastermind group in the subject line. Tell them what practice you're in, a little bit about your practice and uh, he can share with you all the details around being involved in a Crown Council mastermind group. Uh, next, let me introduce you to Mel Robbins. Uh, Mel has become somewhat of a sensation around the world, uh, now has her own syndicated show. Uh, her book entitled The Five Second Rule has such a simple concept and it's very powerful. It's called, it's called The Five Second Rule. Basically, the, the principle here is that anytime there's something that you're not feeling like doing, like mm, getting out of bed, that you simply just count backwards from five, five, four, three, two, one, go. And that there's some science around this simple little formula 
that will get you moving in the direction that you should be going because it moves the decision center from your amygdala where all of your emotions rest to your frontal cortex, which is your, your decision-making area. It moves that decision from the emotional realm into the logical realm, and you'll get moving in where you want to go. There are so many different applications of this really, really simple principle. Um, one that we talked about was how can you apply the five-second rule at home uh, when there's maybe things you don't want to do or uncomfortable situations. Uh, things that need to get done, five, four, three, two, one, go, and, uh, and everybody gets with it, as well as at the office. Uh, so one of the things that Mel challenged us to consider is what is our one decision that we have been hesitating or that we have been procrastinating or that we've been putting off uh, personally, and how can you apply just that simple five, four, three, two, one, go principle to get started on it and get going? So what's your one decision? Uh, kind of similar to James Lawrence's uh, uh, challenge to us. Uh, she, she challenged us to, to examine where we're procrastinating, where we do it the most, and how you can apply that very simple principle of five, four, three, two, one, go uh, for overcoming procrastination. And uh, she introduced to us the, uh, the idea of an anchor thought, which is a, a positive thought that is an anchor for you for getting things done or initiating or getting started. And uh, asked us, what is your anchor thought, that positive thought that gets you anchored, that gets you positive, that, um, that gets you going uh, in the right direction and to focus on that by design <clears throat> when you wanna move things in the right direction. Uh, so here was another application of the anchor thought is as a team, what is your team anchor thought? So if, there, if you've had positive experiences in, in the past as a team and you have a word or a phrase that kind of takes you back to that particular place in your practice history that is positive in nature, that periodically you can conclude your team meeting in the morning uh, with that anchor thought or something that it is positively associated with uh, things that you've done in the past that will get you headed in the right direction. Uh, finally, uh, Mel encouraged us to examine fan behavior. So when you think of a sports fan, uh, what are the biggest characteristics? They cheer, they praise, they tell others all about their favorite team or athlete or whatever it is that they're a fan of. And, and her challenge to us was, uh, who are you a fan of? Fellow team members, uh, your patients, your family, who are you the biggest fan of? And what can you do to be a better fan? Uh, so if you were to think of that in that context, what can you do to be a better fan, a bigger fan of the people you work with, of your patients, the people at home, and exhibit uh, fan-like behavior uh, to, to praise and encourage and cheer them on, which was a great, <clears throat> a great reminder to be a bigger and a better fan. Uh, a couple of suggestions here as we uh, bring this in for landing. Uh, we spent some time at the annual event really working on the culture in the practice. Uh, we played a game we call Cards on the Table that gave everybody in the practice the opportunity to make some commitments and set some goals around their own personal contribution to the office based on feedback from uh, other team members. We've got a great tool in the Crown Council, a piece of software uh, called Culture Builder that allows everybody in the practice to give feedback uh, to the practice as well as to each other. We rec highly recommend this, that you use it on a regular basis uh, so that you're continually getting uh, good feedback from every member of the team on how the whole practice can improve. So uh, the recommendation, if you are not currently using Culture Builder in your practice, uh, grab your phone and if you'll text the word culture to this phone number that's on the screen, 385-213-3007. If you'll just 
if you just text the word culture to that number, so just get on your text app, your message app, uh, text the word culture to that phone number, it will send you a link uh, that will give you more information about Culture Builder, uh, get you signed up for it so you can start, uh, start using it in your practice. So the practices that use this, it's a huge, huge tool to help you improve uh, the culture in your practice on a regular basis. So again, just, just uh, text culture to uh, 385-213-3007. Uh, finally, uh, we announced the 25th annual event coming up uh, January 28th through February 1st, 2020 in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it's going to be, again, our 25th uh, annual meeting, uh, and it, it will be one of the most spectacular events, annual events that we've ever had. Uh, for more information on that, you can go to ccannualevent.com uh, on your screen. If by chance, uh, if you're at the annual event, uh, we had huge enrollment for next year. Uh, we are almost at capacity already for next year's annual event. Uh, and if you have not signed up, you can go to ccannualevent.com, uh, click on the register now to attend button that's right here. And uh, all of the information is there. We're going to be in Nashville, Tennessee. We've got some very exciting events that are planned around being in the home of country music in Music City, USA, as well as an amazing program uh, that, is, um, that has been planned. Uh, there is, up until March 1st, uh, there is a, a great opportunity to sign up for the annual event preferential tuition if you sign up before March 1st. So I uh, encourage to go there today, uh, register, <clears throat> and get your team on board to come to one of dentistry's most amazing uh, meetings of the year that grows the person, grows your patients and your practice. Um, we're very much looking forward to an amazing annual event again coming up in uh, January 28th through February 1st, 2020 in Nashville, Tennessee. You can plan now to attend. Uh, it is an annual excursion for all the practices to attend, and we look forward to having you with us again next year. So that was my quick list of secrets from the annual event. That is but a sliver of what we covered together over the three days that we were at the annual event, but some things that you can act on with your team, whether you were there or not, uh, some great events, and we'll be rolling out additional reminders uh, throughout the year. Uh, it is This is really kind of the anchor event for the Crown Council that we do every year. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, put on your calendar, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, Tuesday, March 19th, will be our next webinar on financial arrangements and collections. So we'll be talking about some of your biggest financial arrangements, uh, insurance filing and collections uh, challenges with some, some suggestions on how you can improve performance in that area. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar. We'll look forward to uh, being back again with you on March 19th and look forward to hearing from you. Plenty of great ways to improve your culture of success in your practice. Thanks for being with us.